parking lot, see, and uh, we're going to have fun out there afterwards. Well, today, I want to bring a message I just entitled, The Blood, the, the Cloud, and the Sea. But I wanted to start in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. It's talking about the children of Israel as they come out of Egypt. It says they had the gospel preached to them, but it didn't benefit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. So often what we do is we think that what we need is we need knowledge, that if we know something, that it's operating in our life. But that is not true. The, the great uh, church, what can we call him, evangelist and, and church founder, John Wesley called it mental ascent. He said, if you say to somebody, did Jesus die on the cross? They'll say yes. If you say, was he buried? They'll say yes. You say, did he rise from the dead? They'll say yes. Is he seated at the right hand of God? Yes. Is he coming again? Yes. They know all the right information. He said, but it's in their head and not in their heart. And the difference is this, when it's in your heart, it changes the way you live. And if it doesn't change the way that you live, all you have is mental assent. You know something and you, you, you have it in your head, but it's not in your heart. And notice, it didn't profit them. They heard it, they believed it, but it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. It wasn't changing the way that they lived. They didn't put, uh, how do we say this, works with what they believed in their head. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now it's talking about they're coming out of Egypt. The Egyptians are chasing them. They come to the Red Sea. And they passed through all night. He says they were under the cloud and they passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Uh, all through the Bible, if, well, put it this way, in the Old Testament, there's types and there's shadows. So we can say it kind of like this. What's in the old concealed is in the new revealed. In the Old Testament, you look and it's kind of concealed. It's cloudy, right? But when you get to the New Testament, it's clear, right? So what's in the old concealed is in the new revealed. They all ate of the same spiritual food. They drank of the same spiritual rock. And they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness, so they have just come through really three different experiences. One has to do with the blood, one has to do with the cloud, and one has to do with the sea. For some of you, this may not be new, but Peter said this. He said, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. You know, it's sometimes we think I know it, but again, it's mental. It's just in our head. It's what we have working in our life that makes the difference. In fact, if all of us had everything that we know working in our life, I think we'd all be spiritual giants. Because there's things we know that aren't working. They, we, we haven't applied them. They're not changing us. So the children of Israel have been in Egypt for 430 years. They're slaves. They're working for the Egyptians. And Moses shows up and... He's their deliverer. Nine plagues have taken place in, in Egypt. Each plague is against the, the, literally the gods of the Egyptians. Right? They worship the Nile, so the Nile is turned into blood. They worship frogs. Who knows why? Right? But they have, a, they have a plague of frogs. Right? They worship the sun, so the sun goes dark. I mean, every plague is against one of the gods of the Egyptians, right? But then God says there's going to be one last plague. He says, and Israel is my firstborn, and Egypt has not allowed my firstborn to come free and worship me, so I'm going to judge their firstborn. God said to Moses, tell all the people on the 10th day of the month, take a lamb into your house. Keep it till the 14th day. 
as the sun sets, take the lamb out and kill the lamb. And there was a very specific way that the lamb had to die. It had to die with its throat cut so the blood could be collected. And then he said, take that blood and take a bunch of hyssop, which is really just a very common shrub in that part of the world. Stand in front of your house, put the hyssop in the blood and strike above your door, strike on each side of the door with the blood. Right? And God made this statement. He said, the Lord will pass through and he will pass over the door with the blood and not allow the destroyer, the devil, to come into your house to strike you. Wherever the blood was, God said, I will not allow the destroyer. Now, of course, that Passover lamb is a type of Jesus. In the New Testament, it says that Jesus, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. And they put that blood on the door and they did it with hyssop. Of course, today, we still are set free by the blood. Revelation 12, verse 11, and they, that's us, overcome him, that's the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. They applied the blood with hyssop, but we apply the blood with our tongue, right? We apply the blood with our testimony. We begin to testify what the blood of Jesus has purchased for us. Now, Jesus' blood didn't soak into the ground at Calvary. The Bible says this in Hebrews 9, but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater, the more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, of this creation. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel had a tabernacle, and once a year, the priest went in with blood and put it on the mercy seat that was in that tabernacle, and he obtained forgiveness for one year for the people. And really, the, 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 the Hebrew word would tell you that they, they, their sins were covered. They were never taken away. They were just covered. But Jesus went into the more perfect tabernacle. He went into the tabernacle of heaven, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all because Jesus' blood could do what the blood of calves and bulls never could, which was take away sin. Having obtained eternal redemption for us, having obtained eternal redemption, Right? So that's what the blood of Jesus has done for you and for me. And it's a type of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They put the blood on their door, and that night, at midnight, wherever the blood was not, the firstborn would die. And they left that night. They left Egypt. Now, for you and me, this is what the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1. It says, in giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, notice God qualified you. You don't qualify yourself. In other words, you aren't part of God's family because of the great things you do or the good things that you've done. And you don't have an inheritance because of what you've done. God the Father qualifies you, right? And he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. When God looks at this world, God doesn't see Africans and Asians and Russians and Europeans and South Americans. When God looks at the world, he sees those that are in Christ and those that are not in Christ. That's just the only thing really that God even recognizes. Which kingdom are you in? Are you in the kingdom of darkness, or are you in the kingdom of the son of his love? And when we become part of his family, he takes us out of the kingdom of darkness. Now, it's really important to know what's in that kingdom, because anything in that kingdom doesn't belong in your life. Anything in that kingdom, we resist, right? Now, in fact, the Bible says resist the devil, and it actually means to actively fight against Right? Actively fight against. So that's temptation, but that's everything that Satan brings. And he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. 
You look at Jesus' ministry and you find Jesus going about, but really Jesus only did about three things, right? He would preach and teach. He would heal the sick and he would cast out devils. Preach, teach, heal the sick, cast out devils, right? He was resisting everything that was a part of the demonic kingdom, right? So you and I were put into the kingdom of the son of his love, right? Revelation 1 says this, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And the, so often we forget the rest and made us. So he didn't just take us from something, he took us to something. He took us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. He took us away from our sin and made us to be kings and priests to God his father. In God's kingdom, you are a king and you are a priest. You were redeemed with the blood of Jesus as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Jesus, that's the first thing. They come out of Egypt because of the blood. But as they come out, they're out in the wilderness. Pharaoh thinks, you know what? I should have never let them go. And remember, I want you to say, Pharaoh is a type of the devil, right? And he says, I should have never let him go. So he takes his army and his 600 chariots, and he begins to pursue the Israelites into the wilderness. Uh, it's really interesting that it didn't take God long to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? But it took a long time to get Egypt out of the children of Israel, right? Leaving Egypt, the book of Deuteronomy tells us this, to the promised land is an 11-day journey. You say, how long did it take? 40 years. It took them 40 years. It was a how long? An 11-day journey. But it took them 40 years. The problem was this. God got the Israelites out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of the Israelites. You say, God may have gotten you out of the kingdom of darkness, all right, but, he, but what the devil wants to do is he's going to pursue you. He's going to come after you. I think it's interesting when Jesus is tempted, he's been in the desert 40 days praying and fasting. The devil is tempting him. And then finally, after he had ended all temptations, Luke 4 said this, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. Right? This is Jesus. The devil didn't get like go, okay, Jesus, you won. Right? The devil, like he left looking for a more opportune time. He was just looking for another opportunity. I remember as a young Christian, I, I, I said, God, I'm just going to love you so much. I'm going to be so spiritual. I'll never get tempted again. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> In fact, years later, I had somebody come up to me and ask me, pray for me, Pastor, that I'll never have any more temptations. And I said, shall I go home, get a gun and shoot you? Because the only way you're not going to have any more temptations is if you're dead. When you get to heaven, all the temptation's over. Right? But as long as you're in this earth, as long as you're in your earth suit, there's going to be temptation. Even Jesus, the devil, he left for a more opportune time. Right? He was following. He was looking. And that's what happened when the Israelites came out of Egypt. Pharaoh, 600 chariots, and his whole army are chasing them, trying to bring them back into Egypt. In Exodus 14, they're standing at the edge of the Red Sea. The enemy is behind them. And Moses is calling out to God, saying, God, do something. And I think it's interesting. God, God said to Moses, what are you doing? Get up. Get off your face. And God said, you do something. You do something. He said, you go to the sea, extend your rod over the sea. He said, I'm going to open the sea so you can walk through that sea, right? So the enemy is pursuing, and they come to the Red Sea. Now, this is what Moses said to the children of Israel. 
God's going to bring a great salvation for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. There's going to be a line of demarcation where the devil has no more right to follow you, no more right to come after you. And what happens? God opens the sea and they go through the sea and they are baptized unto Moses. Right? Well, we aren't baptized unto Moses, but we are baptized into Jesus, right? which is much more significant. Right? But even in the Old Testament, there was a line of demarcation. He said, look, your enemies, you will see them no more again forever. Right? When you get baptized, this is what you're saying. You're saying, that old man that I was is dead. What do you, you know what we do with dead people? We bury them. Right? And when you go in those waters, you're saying, the old person that I was, that person is dead. Right? And I'm going to come up as a new person. In fact, the Bible says just as Jesus came up from the dead to live in newness of life, so we also, right? when we get baptized, we are saying just like Jesus came up in newness of life, there is the power of God on my life to live a new and different life. There is that line of demarcation. I I've known Christians who were saved for decades and could not get free from certain things in their life. But then they get water baptized, and it's a line of demarcation, and there's freedom. I like to say it like this. The baptism waters are the dirtiest waters in all of West Michigan because there's every kind of addiction in there. There's hate. There's racism. There's prejudice. Right? There, 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 there's alcoholism. There's addiction to cocaine and heroin and pornography and everything else. But you know what? You leave it in the waters of baptism. You leave it. And you come up, the Bible says, to live in newness of life. Right? See, when, you, when you're in Christ, you are a new creature. You're a new creation. But what you do in water baptism is you declare that. And in the, see, some people think it's just an empty ceremony. It's not an empty ceremony. When, when uh, the children of Israel were baptized into Moses, it was a burial. It was a line of demarcation that the enemy had no more legal right to follow them. You see, it's a burial. It's a declaration. And when they, you come up out of those waters, the Bible says, well, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, Romans 6, 4, even so, we also should live in newness of life. There is a new life that we are declaring, right? Now, what so many people try to do, and especially I think it's true in Western culture, we try to be right with God by the things that we do. The law was not, listen, the Ten Commandments in the law were not given so you could obey them and be righteous. Now, should you obey them? Yeah. But look, they will not make you righteous. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that offense may abound. So why did God give the children of Israel the law? To point out their sin. The Bible says he gave the law that the offense, that sin might abound. So you would finally figure out, I'm a mess. I need help. I can't do this on my own. Right? But yet so many people, they're trying to be right with God by what they do. Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. What was the law given to her? So you would know you were a sinner. And no one, not Billy Graham, not Mother Teresa, huh? no one has ever been made right with God by obeying the law. But yet, that's what so many people do. So Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So you're not made righteous with God because of the things that you've done. You're made right with God because of the things Jesus has done. Right? He fulfilled the law. 
And then as a perfect human being, he sacrificed himself in your place. Romans 4, 6. Just as this David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works of the law. So you're made right with God, not because of how good you've been, not because I did this and I didn't do that, but through what Jesus has done, by putting your faith in him, by saying his death was to pay for my sin and I identify with his death. And the Bible goes further. And the Bible says in baptism, you're buried with him. And when you come up out of the water, you're raised together with him. And then Ephesians goes on and says, and God has seated us together with him in heavenly places, far above principality, power, might, dominion, every name that's named, not just in this world, but in the world to come. So water baptism is not just some dead ritual. Right? The power of God was present when the children of Israel went through the sea. And the power of God is present when people are water baptized. But water baptism is even more because they went through and were baptized under Moses in the water and under the cloud. Now, if you'll remember, the Bible's very specific. The children of Israel went through the Red Sea all night, all night long. And the Bible tells us that at night, that cloud became a pillar of fire. So they went through not just water, but they went through and were baptized under a pillar of fire. Now, that is an Old Testament type of what happens in the New Testament. In uh, Matthew 3 and 11, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but there's someone among you greater than I, whose sandal I'm not even worthy to carry. He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, and fire. Right? So, Water baptism was what happened in the sea, but spirit baptism is what happened under that cloud. And remember, Jesus today has a ministry. So many times we think, if I could have just been with the 12 disciples and seen Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry today has three parts. First, the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us. Secondly, Jesus said it this way. He said, I will build my church. And Jesus is building the church. And thirdly, he is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. So that, that spirit baptism was represented by that cloud. Right? So Exodus 15, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea after that cloud. They come, to the, they come out of the water. And, and by the way, Peter said this, he, he's preaching on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter two. And the people say, what should we do? And he said, let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to you and to your children and to as many as are afar off, as many as the Lord your God shall call. He said, be baptized and you shall receive the gift. So notice that first comes the water baptism, then the spirit baptism. So really, we can say this, that water baptism is a promise. It's a promise of more. More of what God has already done in your life through the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So they, they come out, they rejoice because the Egyptians have been drowned in the sea. And then in Exodus 15, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then he went out into the wilderness, assured. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they came to Marah, that's the name of the place. Now, it literally means bitterness. They couldn't drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of the place was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Now, the tree, of course, represents the cross of Jesus. 
And as you as I go through life, how many of you have had some bitter experiences in life? Life has been tough. No, we can put, we can apply the cross to our situation and it brings healing to our hearts. It brings healing into our situation. But it's so interesting. They've only been three days since the miracle that had taken place at the Red Sea. You know, so often we've got the idea, well, if I ever saw a miracle, if God ever did anything for me, man, I'd never doubt God again. He opened the sea and they walked through on dry ground. What more do you want? And three days later, they're complaining. Where's God? Can't God help us? What's the problem? They're already complaining. Three days later. It says this in Psalm 78. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, and again and again they tempted God. And they limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, now the people that are really, how do I say this, super sovereignty people, this really bothers them. Because the Bible says they limited God. God wanted to do more for them than he was able to do for them, right? But they limited God. And we can do this. In fact, I, I really believe this, that none of us, none of us are living in all that God wants us to live in. None of us are receiving everything that God wants us to receive. So they limited the Holy One of Israel. And how did they do it? They didn't remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the enemy, it had only happened three days ago. And they've already forgotten what had happened. They they didn't look back at what had already taken place. It says this in the New Testament in Revelation 19 and verse 10. It says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, when we look at what God has done, it is a sign of what God wants to do again. In in fact, the, 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 (laughs) the word testimony in its root, it actually means do again. Do again. So what God has done for somebody else, he will do again. But yet the children of Israel didn't look at what had happened. And they forgot what God had done. And as a result, they're tempting God. They're limiting God in their life because they don't look at what he has done. And, And so often we do the same thing. The Bible says this about Solomon. It says, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. God appeared to Solomon twice, but yet he turned his heart away from the Lord. You know, what he didn't do was he didn't take the things that God had done in his life, the things that God had shown him, and he didn't steward those things. See, when God does something in our life, we need to steward that thing. We need to remember what God has done, right? And when we don't do that, our heart can turn away from the Lord. So in water baptism, right, first we qualify because of the blood, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. The Bible says the Father has qualified us to be for our share of the inheritance of the benefits And remember, David said it in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction, satisfies your mouth with good things so your youth is renewed like the eagles. I mean, he talks about the benefits of being a part of the kingdom of God. But so often we limit God. We limit him by not remembering and looking at his testimonies. And by the way, David took the Bible, and he said, God, all of your testimonies are our inheritance. You look at what God has done, it's your inheritance. It's what God will do again. But we limit God. We limit him because we don't look at what he has done. So there's water baptism after the blood. Then there's spirit baptism. And I think it's interesting, they come tomorrow. And there God makes a covenant with them. And God says to them, 
I am the Lord, your physician. I'm the Lord, your healer. Right? So the blood, the water, the cloud, they come tomorrow, and God makes a covenant of healing with them. Like it's so interesting. And I believe in our lives, we come out of the world, we go through water baptism, spirit baptism, and then we're supposed to recognize that we, we aren't going to limit God, right? He wants to do so much more for us than what we so often think God is, was willing to do for us. We limit him when we don't look at his testimonies. And one of the things we see right here is God became their healer. They looked to him for their healing. Well, would you bow your heads for just a moment? And Father, I pray right now for each and for every one of us. I pray, Father, that, that your word that's been sown in our hearts, I pray, Father, that it'll bring forth fruit in every life. I pray, Father, that your testimonies will be our delight. I pray, Father, that none of us will turn our hearts away from you, Lord, but we'll, we'll look at what you've done, we'll remember what you've done, and we will not be limiting the Holy One of Israel. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Say, so I want to close uh, my part.